It's a great pleasure to be here with you on this panel uh, called The Second Amendment, Next Steps in the Unfolding Legal Battle. As everyone in this room knows, I'm sure the Supreme Court wrote a landmark opinion in 2008 in the Heller case uh, involving a gun regulation here in the district. That was followed up two years later in Otis McDonald's case uh, against Chicago, which made the Second Amendment incorporated against the states, like almost all of the other rights contained in the Bill of Rights. Uh, and just recently, on November 3rd, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in a very important uh, case after a relatively lengthy period of time with, with little said on the matter. So we have an expert panel here today to fill in all the blanks, and uh, we're going to do this in two sections. We're going to start by focusing on the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case that was just argued versus Bruin. And we're going to have each uh, of our experts present on that case. And then after, and then we'll have a little bit of debate and discussion on that. And then after, uh, we're going to get into the broad range of issues uh, beyond the issue raised in that case. So, um, very honored to be moderating with three great experts. Our first speaker will be David H. Thompson, the managing partner of Cooper and Cooper and Kirk, PLLC, here in Washington. He joined the firm at its founding. Mr. Thompson has extensive trial and appellate experience in a wide range of matters and has secured victories worth billions of dollars. He's litigated in cases, I have litigation envy when I read this. He's litigated cases in over 30 federal district courts and argued in each of the 13 federal circuit courts of appeal and before the United States Supreme Court, as well as many state courts. Mr. Thompson was awarded his bachelor's degree magna cum laude from Harvard, where he was Phi Beta Kappa, and his law degree uh, from Harvard as well in 1994 with honors. Uh, please welcome David Thompson. Thank you, Judge, and thank you uh, so much to the Federalist Society for putting together this panel. It's really an honor to share the podium with Judge Hardiman, who has had such a distinguished uh, record on the Third Circuit, and to share it with Jonathan Lowy and Mark Smith, who are two of the most knowledgeable and skilled Second Amendment scholars and advocates in the country. I want to start my remarks in this round by talking about the Bruin case, talking about that New York case uh, that Judge uh, referenced. Um, just a little bit of background in over 40 states, I believe it's 43 states in America and the District of Columbia, you have a right as a law-abiding citizen to have a permit to carry a firearm. But there are a few uh, states on the coast, New York, New Jersey, California, Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, where you can't have a, get a permit to carry a firearm unless you have a good reason. What counts as a good reason? Well, let me tell you one thing that doesn't count as a good reason, which is being a law-abiding citizen who wants to carry a firearm for self-defense. That's not a good reason, and it's not a good reason even if you live in a crime-infested area. Now, the First Circuit, the Second Circuit, the Third Circuit over a compelling dissent by someone I won't mention, the Fourth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit all upheld these laws, and the D.C. Circuit struck them down. So there was a clear split in authority, and in June of 2020, a cert petition was filed challenging New York's law, and there's a clear split. There was a lot of expectation that there would be a grant uh, in that case, and there wasn't. And then just a couple of months later, a, a similar petition by the same lawyers cha challenging the same type of regime and the same issues and the same arguments was granted. What had changed? Well, Justice Ginsburg had been replaced by Justice Barrett. So if you need any evidence, further evidence of the significance of that change, look no further than the Second Amendment. Um, so what are the issues that uh, the court is going to have to confront? The first is the proper analytical framework. Heller emphasized text, 
history, and tradition as the basis for striking down DC's ban on the possession of a handgun, and the lower courts have pretty consistently declined to follow Heller's approach. They've reasoned that text, history, and tradition only applies to the core of the Second Amendment, and they say the word keep that's in the core, but the word bear, two words later, that's not in the core. That's in the periphery and the penumbras. And so they don't apply text, history, and tradition. Instead, they apply intermediate scrutiny. And the analysis goes something like this. Public safety is really important. This law relates to public safety. Legislatures know a lot more about that than we do. Voila, you don't have any Second Amendment rights. That's what the lower courts have been saying. Now, Chief Justice Roberts, during the Heller uh, oral argument, said, uh, these tiers of scrutiny, aren't they like a barnacle that's attached to parts of the Constitution? You know, this isn't uh, part of the, the actual original framework, and he's absolutely right. If you look at the history of the tiers of scrutiny, you'll see that it was an invention of left-wing activist judges in the 1960s that when text and history forbade them from reaching a desired policy result, then they reverted to and created tiers of scrutiny, basically saying, well, yes, we know the text in the history says that you have a right to X, but we tell you as judges that there's really an important reason, a compelling reason why you don't have that right. You don't have to look any further than, for example, affirmative action. You would have thought the word equal meant equal, and yet we are told, at least for 25 years under Grutter, that equal doesn't mean equal. It if there's diversity, there's compelling interest. So that's the first thing they're going to have to look at is what is the proper analytical framework. And anyone who's interested in this, I would commend to you uh, Joelle Alicia's and John Ohlendorf's article in the 2019 National Affairs. Their amicus brief was cited to and referenced by Justice Kavanaugh in the oral argument. And it's really a masterpiece showing that the intellectual bankruptcy behind tiers of scrutiny. Fortunately, I don't think there are five votes on the United States Supreme Court to erase the Second Amendment through intermediate scrutiny. Instead, the courts are going to start, the court is going to start with the text the, of the operative clause, which says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. How much clearer could they have been if we were all gathered around a table and we wanted to create, you know, a robust right to own and carry a firearm, I think we'd be hard pressed to do better than that. And certainly if you look at the founding time, you look at Samuel Johnson's dictionary, you look at Noah Webster's dictionary, then as now, bear means to carry. And that makes sense. Because if we think about the purposes identified by Heller uh, behind the Second Amendment, it's self-defense. Obviously, that takes place in and outside of the home. It's hunting outside and fighting tyranny. That's outside, too. Last time I checked the history of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. So the text really ought to dispose of New York's law, but if there were any doubt, we could look to the history. And we would look at treatises from Blackstone that said, that there's absolutely a right to carry a firearm outside the home. We could look at the practice of the founders. If we look at the first seven presidents of the United States, all of them were alive at the time of the adoption of the Second Amendment, and all of them were carrying on a regular and frequent basis. And so this puts the United States Supreme Court to a test, and there's no middle ground. They either have to brand the first seven presidents of the United States habitual criminals, or they have to find that there's a right, and there was a right and there is a right, to carry a firearm outside the home. Spoiler alert, they're not going to brand them criminals. Okay. <laughs> the laws that were in place at the time of the founding also confirm that there was a right to carry a firearm outside the home. In fact, in many states and colonies, you were required to carry a firearm to church and on other occasions. There are also laws that prohibited slaves from carrying a firearm. Well, if there really was a general prohibition and no one had a right to carry, why would you have this entirely superfluous law saying slaves can't carry either? Uh, so that's further evidence. The, the other problem uh, New York has is the dog that didn't bark in the night. They cannot find one, not 
one instance of anyone in the entirety of colonial American history who was arrested for carrying a firearm peaceably in defense of themselves. Now you might say, yeah, but people were angels back then. You really didn't need to carry a firearm back, you know, and, uh, you know, but if you look at the murder rates in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, they were multiples higher than even under Bill de Blasio's New York. <laughs> so there was a need to carry a firearm back then for self-defense. Um, you might say, well, what does the other side have to say about this? Well, they have five arguments on history, and let me just run through them quickly. Number one, they point to the Statute of Northampton, a 1328 English law, and in fairness, there were some uh, American colonies, Virginia, Massachusetts, that had analogs to the Statute of Northampton at the time of the adoption of the Second Amendment. But remember, Virginia, Massachusetts, first six presidents came from those two states and regularly carried a firearm. Thomas Jefferson said to his nephew, let your gun be your constant, your constant companion. So again, the practice of the founders shows that, and court decisions as well, show that those laws were not understood to be a prohibition on peaceful carriage. The statute of Northampton and its analogs prohibited uh, carrying to the terror of the people. You couldn't terrorize people with a firearm, but you could uh, peacefully carry for self-defense. The second historical argument they make relates to a Massachusetts law from 1836, a, a so-called surety law. Now the first point is 1836, all the founders are dead. Okay, so what does an 1836 law tell you about what the founders think? I would submit precious little, but leaving aside the fact that it's too late, it wasn't a ban on carriage. Here's how it worked. If someone in the community identified you as a menace to society, and if a judge found that you were a menace to society, you could carry a firearm, provided you posted a bond so that if you misused it, you, you would lose the bond. And that's how it worked. That's not a ban. And moreover, if you think about it, the invocation of that law explodes New York's view of history. Why? Because they are postulating that before 1836 in Massachusetts, there was a complete ban on carriage and nobody could carry. And then they say in 1836, one and only one type of person was permitted to carry. People who were deemed to be a menace to society and posted a bond that can't possibly be right and there's not a scintilla of evidence to demonstrate it or support it. Now the third point they make is that there were bans on concealed carry in the early 19th century and they're right about that but there was litigation over those bans and courts consistently upheld those bans on concealed carry but expressly and explicitly because they permitted open carriage. And our position in litigating these cases has been that as long as the state allows carriage, it could be open, it could be concealed, then the Second Amendment has been honored. Now the fourth thing they point to is the Wild West. I was a little surprised that they were pointing to the Wild West as a paradigm of lawfulness and sort of the North Star of constitutional <laughs> adjudication. Was there a right to gay marriage in the Wild West? Were all the other provisions of the Bill of Rights honored in the Wild West, uh, but even if we were going to look at the Wild West as, you know, sort of compelling evidence, it's too late. Number one, it's after the Civil War, and number two, a, it was only a tiny minority, Tombstone, Arizona, Dodge City, where they had these types of bands. The fifth argument they make relates to uh, the idea that, well, you had a right to carry in rural areas, but you didn't have a right to carry in a densely populated area. Now remember what Thomas Jefferson said to his nephew, let your gun be your constant companion, not your companion except when you're around other people. And remember what John Adams, who defended uh, the, the officers in the Boston Massacre trial, and that uh, incident, the Boston Massacre, took place at State Street. And then, as now, it is one of the most urban environments in the United States. And even though it was an admission against his clients, uh, John Adams conceded that yes, the Bostonians, the ordinary citizens, had a right to be armed at the site of the Boston Massacre. Um, so, uh, that argument I don't think is going to carry the day 
either. If we, uh, Mark, I know, is going to talk about some of the social science and, and the modern day realities of carriage and what that means, but there was one just precious colloquy between Justice Alito and the lawyer for New York that I, that I have to highlight. The lawyer from New York expressed complete horror at the idea that there might be guns in the subways of New York. And Justice Alito said, well, how many guns are there uh, today in the subways of New York? And, you know, the, the wheels started spinning. And, you know, by my count, the New York City Police Department has seized 50,000 guns over the last decade, illegal guns, uh, in the city of New York. And that's obviously only a tiny fraction of the actual number of guns. And so their guns in the New York City subways today, the only thing is, it's the criminals who have them, not law-abiding citizens, and that's not the system that the founders set up. Now, there was a lot of discussion in the uh, um, oral argument about sensitive places. You know, the idea that, well, you don't have a right to bring a gun anywhere, and that's true. You, you could not bring a gun uh, into a courtroom, for example, at the time of the founding. And I think the key thing on this sensitive places is to really watch this and make sure that this exception doesn't swallow the rule. The guide star should be text and history. And what does the, the history say about this? There's an amicus brief by the Independent Institute. It walks through that there were certain uh, narrow exceptions, for example, a courthouse. Why would a courthouse be a gun-free zone? Well, the answer is because there was a bailiff there, and the bailiff would keep the peace. I think the modern-day analog would be when you're on the other side of TSA. You don't have a reason to carry a firearm. The government is keeping you entirely safe. Um, likewise, in schools, uh, the University of Virginia adopted a ban on guns by students, not teachers, by students while Jefferson and Madison were on the Board of Visitors. So those are two of the limited, narrow, historically based uh, exceptions uh, and limitations on the right to carry. It's not everywhere at every time, uh, but uh, it, text and history should be the guide stars. Thank you. For those standing, there are plenty of seats over here. If you might be a good time to make your way over if, if you'd li rather sit. Uh, thank you, David. Our, our next presenter is Mr. Jonathan Lowy. He is Chief Counsel and Vice President Legal at the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. Uh, since 1997, he has represented victims of gun violence in lawsuits to reform dangerous gun industry practices and assisted governments and public officials in defense of reasonable gun laws. Named as one of the nation's 500 leading lawyers for over a decade, John has litigated in over 40 states to reduce gun violence, including winning several landmark trial and appellate rulings, settlements, and verdicts. He is also the author of multiple law review articles, including The Right Not to be Shot, Public Safety, Private Guns, and The Constellation of Constitutional Liberties. He's also written Everything's at Stake, Preserving Authority to Prevent Gun Violence in the Second Amendment's third chapter. A graduate of Harvard College and the University of Virginia Law School, please welcome Jonathan Lowy. Thank you, Judge Hardiman and, and uh, panel, and thanks so much to the Federal Society for hosting this important event and for seeking a balanced discussion. Um, I'm not one of the usual suspects here, and, and I really appreciate sincerely, uh, in, especially in these divisive times, uh, you know, reaching across and hearing each other out and trying to find common ground as Americans. And that has been Brady's way through our almost 50 years. Uh, our motto is take action, not sides. We belong bipartisan uh, tradition. We're founded by Republicans. Uh, we're named after Republicans. Our agenda is simply to reduce gun deaths and injuries, which is a goal I hope all of us share and should be central to our discussion here today. And in a search for common ground in discussing the future of the Second Amendment, I suggest we respect certain principles that have been traditionally considered conservative ones. One, 
In our democracy, policy should generally be determined by the people through their elected representatives. Two, judges should not be making policy. Three, judges should show great deference to the politically accountable branches of government. Four, that deference should be at its apex when public safety is at stake, where courts have always recognized broad governmental authority. And five, judicial decisions should not be based on the personal or policy viewpoints of judges. To violate any of those principles uh, is, as is often said, judicial activism. All of these principles weigh in favor of a narrow construction of private gun rights under the Second Amendment and against a broad right to carry guns in public sought in NYSERPA v. Bruin. As has been discussed, Bruin seeks to strike down a policy that the people of New York have enjoyed for over a century that restricts the carrying of loaded hidden guns in public to those with good cause. That policy could be repealed by the people if they so wish, but they have not chosen to do so. And for good reason. That law, along with other strong gun laws, has helped give New York one of the lowest gun death rates in the nation. The issue in Bruin is whether five justices should do what the people of New York have decided they do not want and mandate virtually anyone to be allowed to carry hidden loaded guns in public. That is the policy in many states, including, by the way, the states with the top gun death rates in the nation. But about a quarter of the US population has chosen a more restrictive policy. It's no coincidence that those states with restrictive carry policies have some of the lowest gun death rates in the nation. Now, conservative principles of judicial restraint counsel against such policymaking by the courts. As Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson recognized, mandating a broad right to carry intrudes on, quote, popular governance. And it's potentially dangerous, Judge Wilkinson wrote, quote, this is serious business. We do not wish to be even minutely responsible for some unspeakably tragic act of mayhem because in the peace of our judicial chambers, we miscalculate it as to Second Amendment rights. Another conservative jurist, Michael Ludig, said expressly about Bruin, quote, conservatives, textualists, and originalists believe or should that the Second Amendment ought not be interpreted to take from the people and their legislatures the historical and traditional authority they have had for centuries to decide where handguns may be carried in public and in public places. As these jurists recognized, Heller does not mandate a broad right to carry. The holding of Heller was that the Second Amendment protects a right of law-abiding responsible citizens to a gun in the home for self-defense. That was it. And Heller's finding that the Second Amendment protects some right to guns for self-defense is far too shaky a foundation on which to deprive states of their long-standing police power authority to restrict guns in public. Such an expansion of Heller contradicts the very text, history, and tradition test its proponents purport to rely on. And when we consider that test, it's worth recalling how radical the ruling in Heller was. Before 2008, the view that the Second Amendment only protects bearing arms in the, quote, well-regulated militia referenced in its text was so settled that former Chief Justice Warren Burger, a Nixon appointee, called the notion that the Second Amendment restricts private gun laws, quote, one of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word, fraud, on the American people by special interest groups I have seen in my lifetime, close quote. After all, the framers did not include a statement of purpose in any other of the Bill of Rights, but they did chose, choose to include one in the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security 
of a free state. History shows that the amendment was driven by anti-federalist concerns that the newly created federal government could monopolize military might and starve state militias. Whatever the framers thought about guns, whatever the gun-carrying practices of our presidents or others were, the framers did not have private gun rights on their minds when they drafted and ratified the Second Amendment. And that, by the way, is the critical issue, not whether it was legal for seven presidents to carry, just as it's not an issue of whether the people of 43 states have the legal right to carry. The question is, is there a constitutional right under the Second Amendment? Now, James Madison, who, who drafted the Second Amendment, pointedly chose not to include formulations from some states and dissenters that did protect private self-defense or hunting. And the ratification debates solely concerned militias, not private gun rights. Now, Justice Scalia, in his majority opinion in Heller, conceded that protecting the militia, quote, was the reason that the right was codified. But he then asserted, quote, that can only show that self-defense had little to do with the right's codification. It was the central component of the right itself. I've puzzled over that sentence for 12 years. Now, there was no citation in it or real explanation as to why a purpose that the framers did not mention was central, but the purpose stated in the text was not. So much for text and history. This reading effectively erases the amendment's militia clause and rewrites the constitutional text to read something like, guns being a necessity for private self-defense, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Which, by the way, to answer Mr. Thompson's question, would be a much clearer way to embrace the right that he is advocating. Now, historical studies since Heller have only confirmed its errors. And this all raises a very insightful and important question raised by Justice Barrett in the Bruin argument, which was, and I'm paraphrasing, does the court have to accept Heller's findings on history? I think the answer is clearly no. That is not what courts do. Five justices cannot declare that George Washington was not our first president, nor can five justices declare that the historical purpose of the Second Amendment was something that the framers never mentioned in the text or ratification debates. But despite Heller's questionable rulings, <clears throat> it does not support a broad right to carry guns in public, much less concealed guns. Heller recognized expressly that most 19th century courts upheld prohibitions on concealed carry, prohibitions, mind you, not just discretionary permitting like New York has. And the history bears this out, which is very different from the history Mr. Thompson uh, discussed from 19th, 13th century England to 20th century America, public gun carrying was greatly restricted. Another conservative jurist, Ninth Circuit Judge J. Bybee, uh, surveyed this history and in rejecting a similar challenge to carry restrictions, concluded that, quote, or a, quote, review of more than 700 years of English and American legal history reveals a strong theme government has the power to regulate arms in the public square. In fact, over a century ago, the Supreme Court recognized that, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms is not infringed by laws prohibiting the carrying of concealed weapons. Now, I don't think 21st century gun laws should be constrained by history and tradition. To me, it shouldn't matter how Americans regulated muskets or early firearms in the 1780s or the 1870s when there was no thriving gun industry or gun violence epidemic. But if text, history, and tradition is the test that is applied, every one of those factors support allowing Americans to restrict public gun carrying, certainly when concealed. And if the court purports to rely on text, history, and tradition, to find a broad right that is at odds with all three factors, 
such a decision would severely damage the institutional credibility of the courts. It will suggest that policy preferences, not judicial principle, may be driving Second Amendment decisions. Worse, such a decision may rely on alternate facts, or to put it more plain, untruths. In Brune, Nyserpa's counsel claimed repeatedly that states that generally allow concealed carry have comparable gun violence as states like New York. And he repeatedly pointed to Phoenix, Houston, and Chicago as cities in relaxed carry states that he said, quote, have not had demonstrably worse problems, close quote, than states with New York-like restrictions. Those assertions are false. In truth, Phoenix, Houston, and Chicago have homicide rates that are more than two, three, and five times the rates of New York. Indeed, nine of the 10 cities with the highest murder rates in the country are in states with right to carry laws. The 10 states with the most gun violence all have right to carry laws. Yet six of the seven states with the lowest gun death rates all have restrictive carry laws like New York's. In fact, just yesterday, the Washington Post fact checker verified that NYSERPA's claims were incorrect and gave NYSERPA counsel Paul Clement three Pinocchios for them. Now studies confirm that right to carry laws are associated with 13 to 15 percent higher violent crime rates. Another study found that individuals carrying guns were over four times more likely to be shot and fatally shot in an assault than those not carrying. More concealed carry guns lead to significantly more crime and more deaths. Yet the fantasy persists that untrained civilians going about their lives can be relied on to whip out their guns in parks and streets and hit only the bad guy and be correct that the bad guy is the one who should be shot. Well, my organization is named after James Brady who as White House press secretary was in the entourage of perhaps the best protected man on the planet, but even a battalion of highly trained, well-armed Secret Service could not stop a single gunman from nearly killing him. Now, the lesson that Jim and Sarah Brady learned was not to beef up the security detail, but to keep guns out of dangerous people's hands. In fact, even trained police officers miss their targets most of the time. And as recent shootings show, police too often end up needlessly shooting people, often fatally. There are worse outcomes with civilians who have less training, less preparedness for high stress incidents, and less ability to know who is a real threat. In a Harvard study, judges found that most reported self-defense gun uses that they reviewed were probably illegal. The fact is, while guns are occasionally used in self-defense, it is far more likely that a gun will be used in a homicide, suicide, or unintentional shooting. Study after study shows that strong gun laws save lives. After Connecticut passed a law requiring a permit to purchase a gun, gun deaths fell by 40%. After Missouri repealed a similar law, the gun death rate increased at least 25%. And it is true that a majority of states have generally permissive gun laws, but those laws are not a product of public will, but of gun lobby clout. Polls show that over 90% of Americans support background checks on all gun sales. Solid majorities favor licensing and other laws, yet none are laws of the land. And about 70% of America, Americans choose to keep themselves and their families safe by not owning a gun. Yet the courts may force those to face guns virtually everywhere, despite the evidence that it will result in more people dying. Of course, others are free to argue that guns are far more effective for self-defense than the data shows, or as I've suggested, and that the non-gun-owning 70% of Americans are misguided. But the fundamental issue before the court is, who makes those gun policy decisions? The New York legislature or five justices? Courts are on shaky ground 
in depriving Americans of the authority to restrict gun carrying in our parks, streets, and communities for the first time in our history. In closing, I would commend that we all try to come together on some first principles. One, as Thomas Jefferson recognized, the care of human life and happiness, and not their destruction, is the first and only object of good government. Our failure to care for human life, including to protect people from gunfire, has driven America into a gun violence epidemic that claims over 40,000 lives a year and injures many more. No other comparable country tolerates its citizens being subjected to anywhere close to such levels of gun violence. The Second Amendment does not condemn us to this fate. The right to worship, to assemble, to speak is at risk, as is the right that the founders announced first in the Declaration of Independence, the right to life. Now, courts need not agree with what are the best solutions to end our gun violence epidemic, but they should not be the ones deciding what solutions Americans must have. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Last but not least, our third presenter is Professor Mark Smith. He's a New York attorney and a presidential scholar at the King's College. He's a visiting fellow in pharmaceutical public policy and law in the Department of Pharmacology at Oxford University. Professor Smith is a New York Times bestselling author and a frequent guest on the Fox News Channel. He is the author of six books, including First They Came for the Gun Owners, The Campaign to Disarm You and Take Your Freedoms. Professor Smith is the host and producer of the Four Boxes Diner on YouTube, a channel providing in-depth analysis on Second Amendment scholarship and Second Amendment news. Please welcome Mark Smith. It's always a pleasure to be speaking to the Federalist Society which is the center of the vast right-wing conspiracy. <laughs> to begin, I clearly agree that the Second Amendment guarantees a right to carry guns outside the home, and that by simply reading the text of the Second Amendment along with its history should guarantee the outcome of the Nicerpa versus Bruin case. And I equally agree that the notion of the New York proper cause requirement that says basically you need to go to a government agent in New York or elsewhere and say mother may I exercise my fundamental constitutional rights also violates the Second Amendment. That's not how the Constitution works. You don't have to ask permission of the government to exercise your fundamental constitutional rights to go to church, to have guns, or to carry guns. With that said, I'd like to address two specific arguments that New York and their friends have argued before the Supreme Court and to show their fallacies with both. First, New York argues that um, granting concealed carry permits or allowing law-abiding citizens with no criminal record to carry guns in public will somehow give rise to a much more dangerous environment and a danger and a net loss to public safety. The second argument I'm going to address is something many of you may not have heard of. And that is the notion that under the doctrine or philosophy of corpus linguistics, which is Latin for basically the study of language and texts, but we like to use Latin, or at least some people in the anti-gun community apparently like to use it, corpus linguistics, and an explanation why corpus linguistics is not a basis to deny us our fundamental rights to keep and bear arms mentioned specifically in the text of the Second Amendment itself. But let's start with public safety. Now, when you talk about public safety and constitutional rights, I view this as really a logical fallacy, a form of appeal to emotion, where you're essentially waving bloody shirts and saying, see, people get hurt by X, and therefore we need to ban it or stop it. That's not how the Constitution works. 
The reality is that there are no net costs to allowing law-abiding Americans to exercise their fundamental rights to carry a gun. Now, of course, I should not even have to talk about public policy. It should be irrelevant, and it really is legally irrelevant. Why is that? Well, because we know from the, 19, from the 2008 Heller ruling by the Supreme Court that the constitutionality of gun control laws turns on the text, history, and tradition of the Second Amendment and does not get limited or discussed in the context of some social science data-driven discussions of what is good or bad for society. That's not how, again, the Constitution works. In fact, Justice Scalia wrote in Heller specifically that the very enumeration of the right takes the hands, takes the, takes the issue out of the hands of government, including the courts. The power to decide case by case whether or not a right is really worth insisting upon. That's not our call. That's not the legislature's call. That was the founding father's call. We the people spoke to the right to keep and bear arms when we enacted the Constitution. And if you don't like what the Second Amendment says, you should do what Justice Stevens recommended, the late Justice Stevens, which is to go through Article 5 processes and amend the Constitution to remove the Second Amendment. And good luck with that. <laughs> now, of course, public policy considerations and safety considerations are not new, right? Let's just take the most basic common sense first year law student example. The criminal procedural processes in the Bill of Rights, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth, the Seventh Amendment, the Eighth Amendment as well. These are limitations on what government can and cannot do in the prosecution of criminal cases. As a result of enforcing this public policy, as a, as a result of essentially of enforcing these Bill of Rights provisions involving criminal prosecutions, guess what? Some bad criminals actually go free. But a decision was made by the Founding Fathers and, and by us in adhering to the Constitution that sometimes Criminals have to be let free to respect the freedoms and rights protected by Americans in the Bill of Rights. That is a public policy cost, but that doesn't mean that the answer is you reject the Bill of Rights as written in the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, and so on and so on. Now remember, for the sake of argument, let's just play this game out, though. Let us assume for the sake of argument, assuming arguendo, we're talking to lawyers here, that, this, that there are, in fact, five votes on the Supreme Court to say, yeah, yeah, you know, we can balance away constitutional rights involving the Second Amendment if social science teaches us this. So my question is, and I'm going to address, is does New York actually have a public policy argument to somehow restrict the public carry of firearms by law-abiding Americans, Americans or not? The answer is no. If you actually look carefully at the history and the facts on the ground of Americans carrying firearms in public, you find that there really is no basis for denying law-abiding citizens who meet objective criteria, such as I'm not a criminal, I'm not a convicted felon, you know, I'm not in a mental, a mental health institution, from, you know, from barring them from carrying guns. Now, I think the best evidence of this is the lived experience of Americans and the lived experience of states. Let's start from the most basic premise. Let us look at the great and the good among us in society, our betters, if you will. Well, our betters, if you will, the great and the good, know that guns stop bad people from doing bad things to good people. And how do we know this? Because they all either carry guns or they have people, armed bodyguards, that carry guns for them. Whether they be Hollywood celebrities, rich anti-gun donors, and of course, the, the the primary anti-gunners that live in the White House today all have the benefit of armed protection. And ask yourself this, why do police officers carry guns? Why does Secret Service carry guns? What's the point of the guns? Oh yeah, we know because guns actually save lives. They prevent bad people from doing bad things to good people. And by the way, isn't it very interesting that President Biden, when he talks about you carrying guns and me carrying guns in public to protect our lives, that's a gun epidemic. But when it comes to President Biden getting protected by men with guns and women with guns, that's not an epidemic. That's called, you know, appropriate protection of human life. My question to the president was simply this. Hey, Mr. President, if you think guns are bad and don't, and don't do any good, why don't you disarm your security detail? You teach us how it's done. You 
go first. Now we know the reality is, notwithstanding the rhetoric and the appeals to emotion, which as you know from philosophy 101 logic, is a fallacy, we know that guns save lives. In fact, there's a powerful study that I recommend that you all look at from 2021, just you know, earlier this year, by a Georgetown professor named William English, who, who um, he was not the only one, but he's the most recent, uh, that showed that there are 1.67 defensive gun uses in the United States every year. That breaks down to 32,000 defensive gun uses that protect lives every, every week, or 4,575 defensive gun uses every day. Now, what's very interesting about this is that in most instances of guns saving lives and protecting Americans, no shot was fired. Most of the instances of defensive gun use either involved the showing of a gun that caused the threat to run away, or the saying, I've got a gun, you better get out of here. And that was enough to deter countless crimes. And again, 1.67 million defensive gun uses a year according to Bill English from Georgetown, a prestigious university. I think we can all agree. Now, of course, a little bit of common sense is appropriate. Where do you think there's more likely to be a mass shooting? In a building that has a sign that says something like, notice, gun-free zone. We don't believe in guns. No weapons allowed. You think the criminals are going to follow that? Well, Caesar Beccari in the 18th century an important Italian Enlightenment philosopher that the founding fathers all knew well, and actually Jefferson even wrote down the quote I'm about to tell you, Caesar Bercaria specifically talked about how any kind of armed bans only hurts the law-abiding citizen and doesn't do anything to stop criminals from doing criminal things. It does nothing to stop the criminal. It actually only emboldens the criminal. Caesar Bercaria in the 18th century, before the Second Amendment was written, understood this basic common sense view of human life. Of course, um, we know that guns also stop mass shootings from why we've never seen a mass shooting at a police department. What is it about police departments that keep them immune from mass shootings? I don't think it's the cute hatch or the blue uniforms. No, it's the guns. It's the guns that protect innocent lives from criminality and evil doers. So it's very clear that the lived experience I've just described allow for guns to improve public safety. But beyond that, I just want to briefly explain specifically how the New York arguments that guns are that guns somehow lead a to a net cost in public policy. Let's take a look at some of the social scientists and studies that have addressed this issue. Now, I don't want to get into boring statistics too much, although we can, but I'm just going to hit a couple highlights, and that's this. Let's take a look at some of the studies by organizations that I, in my opinion, would not label the NRA or the Second Amendment or proponents like that. Let's take a, a, a typical establishment group like the RAND Corporation. Nothing wrong with the RAND Corporation, but I'm not sure I would view them as Second Amendment advocates. That's just my take. Well, they did a comprehensive survey talking about the explosion of research between carrying guns in public and crime rates, violent crime rates, and they basically said that on all of their analysis, looking at all these studies, they found no connection that more guns equals more violent crime, and that's the RAND Corporation. Now this, by the way, matches up with other studies done by, again, what I would consider more establishment groups, including one arm of the federal government's so, you know, science studies, and also by a 2003 study by the CDC. So again, I think even if you want to talk about statistics, if you look at the sort of the more objective people that are not, uh, that I would say, again, are very establishment, they say that they can't see evidence of more guns, meaning a net negative to public policy in America. And by the way, this is consistent with what we've seen over the last many decades. Remember, since 1975, we've seen a tsunami of states that have made it easier to get guns, made it easier to carry guns, whether it be going to a shall issue permitting system or in 21 states today, a permitless carrying system. So it's a one-way ratchet toward more gun freedom and not less. And as a result of this, Justice Kavanaugh, at oral argument in Bruin, had a very interesting observation. He said that he had not seen any real evidence that the 30, that, I'm sorry, that any real evidence that the 43 states that have shall we your constitutional care regimes have a lot more accidents or crime. Even Kavanaugh noticed that that was not true. 
So again, I think the reality is this. If you look at the states that have loosened their gun, gun laws to make it easier for people to carry guns, to easier to have guns, guess what? It's a one-way ratchet toward gun freedom. Because guess what? In all of those states, you cannot point to one which has actually gone backwards. Those states that have adopted permitless carry, they've adopted shall issue, none of them have said, oh my God, we have blood in the streets, we gotta go backwards. Hasn't happened. Why is that? Because the lived experience, the actual experiences of actual Americans and actual law enforcement agencies in these states demonstrate, without a doubt, that more guns on the street in the hands of law-abiding citizens that meet objective criteria make communities more safe. A lesson that, again, our betters already know. Now, I also want to talk briefly about the notion of corpus linguistics. Now, this was not argued at the end of the day during the oral argument. It did not come up. And New York itself basically recognized probably the fallacy of the argument involving corpus linguistics because they didn't seem to mention it in their brief that I could tell. Now, what is corpus linguistics? All right, really all it is is a fancy way of talking about taking a database of historical documents and running a text electronic search, a Google search of it. And then you look at the conclusions and you draw some conclusions from it. Basically, a, a researcher takes an electronic database um, of the founding era, and they run research, uh, they, they do some search terms, it's keywords or whatever, it spits out results, they read through it, and they try to draw conclusions. So I want to just give you a quick example of how this works, and a simple to use example, and then I'll go back to how it's being used in the Bruin case. Let's, take, let's say you wanted to figure out what the word airplane meant in the early 1940s in American life. Okay? What does airplane mean? Is it military or is it civilian? So in theory, you would go and look at series of databases involving information from 1940 to 1945, let's say, and you would run electronic searches, and you would, they would spit out results, and then you would look at all the different uses of the word airplane in the database, which would include newspaper articles or whatever, okay? Now then, if you then count up the uses, how many uses in the newspapers at the time were of airplanes in the context of military uses or other uses, and then you might say something like, something known as the frequency hypothesis, I'm generalizing here, of course. Um, you say something like, well, in 95% of the uses between 1940 and 1945, the word airplane was used in the military context, and therefore, um, airplane means military airplane. Of course, we know that's absurd, that's not true, because there's plenty of civilian uses for airplanes other than military. But the reason why I mention that is because it's analogous to what's happening, is, in my view, of many people in the corpus linguistics world talking about the Second Amendment. Because what they're doing is they're saying, Heller taught us that we have to use text and history to understand the meaning of the Second Amendment. So they said, let's go back to the time of the founding and look at, do database searches of all these historical documents and try to conclude, does the word Bear arms, the phrase bear arms, does it mean, does it mean military or militia, or does it mean you get to walk around and carry a gun in downtown Boston? And then they say, well, if you look at the founding period and we do all this, you know, searches and then we do all this addition and we do all the subjective measurements, we conclude that overwhelmingly the phrase bear arms means military or militia. Therefore, the Second Amendment commonly was understood to protect a militia right and not an individual right. Of course, this is absurd for several reasons. First of all, this notion was rejected by Heller. This specifically took a, a similar argument by linguists and said, no, that's not how you do it. The, the linguists' uh, briefs and Heller were rejected specifically as this is not how you interpret the Second Amendment. It's not a collective right, it's an individual right. Second of all, of course, if you actually look at what was going on in American history at the time of the founding, guess what was going on? Just like in the early 40s, you had World War II. At the founding period, you have a series of wars where many people were writing about the French and Indian War, they were writing about the American Revolution, and they were also talking about the future of America in terms of standing arms and what else. So you had a lot of discussion at the founding era about you know, arms, bearing arms in the context of militia. But that doesn't answer the critical question the Supreme Court must answer today, which is, in the context of the Second Amendment, where you talk about the right of the people to keep and bear arms, what does that phrase mean? And again, the arguments by the corpus linguistics people, and I'm simplifying here, is essentially that because the common use of bare arms by our math, by our calculations, is mostly military, the Second Amendment must mean military and not private civilian carrying of firearms, which again, uh, I think that's a too simplistic of a view, and I think that's probably why the state of New York did not argument, argue, corpus, argue corpus linguistics. I think that's also why the U.S. Supreme Court probably did not ask any questions at or argument about 
corpus linguistics because they thought it wasn't going to teach the court what the Second Amendment meant. So again, um, I think that uh, to close, labeling something corpus linguistics or, 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 or you know, appealing to emotion is something that I think the Supreme Court's going to see through. And at the end of the day, I think the Supreme Court is going to uphold the text and the history of the Second Amendment and conclude that we as Americans have a fundamental right not just to keep guns in the home loaded for self-defense, but also to carry guns loaded and unlocked outside the home in public for self-defense and confrontation against the evildoers that inevitably, in the human experience, are among us. Thank you. All right. I want to make sure we leave time for questions, so I'm going to ask our, our excellent presenters to sort of have a lightning round here, and I'll start by asking Jonathan, I think um, you made the point that Heller does not uh, necessarily um, mean that there's a right to carry outside the home, that Heller applies outside the home. If I uh, heard the arguments in the Bruin case correctly, it seemed like New York sort of uh, conceded that point. Do you agree that New York uh, started from the premise that there is some right to carry outside the home? Uh, and if so, what do you think about that? Um, I agree, Your Honor, that it sounded like that to me. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure if they conceded it in the pleadings or not, but it's certainly- Just get uh, up on the mic. Is that on? I, I, yeah, I, I read the, the argument the same way as you, Your Honor, that it certainly sounded like New York was not pushing back on the idea that there was some right to carry in public. I'm not sure if they conceded it in the pleadings or not. Um, if that is what they were conceding, I disagree with that view. Um, I, I do think that there is a um, some right to carry in public that's related to the right recognized in, in Heller, like for instance in the uh, Azelle case, if you, to get training and to, to you have your gun and use it safely in the home. Uh, but I do not think that Heller or text history or tradition support a broader right to carry in public. It, just to uh, clarify that uh, they did, I agree, they did concede that in the Supreme Court. I filed that complaint. They did not concede that in the Second Circuit. In the Second Circuit, they said there is no right to carry outside the home at all. And for some reason, when they got to the Supreme Court, they rethought that position. Terrific. Now, next question for, for uh, David and, uh, and Mark. Um, unless I'm, I'm mistaken, and you can correct me if I am, um, when Justice Scalia wrote in the Heller majority opinion um, that that decision was not to call into question long-standing prohibitions that had existed, um, isn't it the case that the states like New York that are attempting to regulate firearm carry this way do point accurately to long-standing laws prohibiting concealed carry. And again, listening to the argument, this was something Mr. Clement had to deal with because he said, well, we don't really, doesn't have to be concealed, doesn't have to be open, but it's gotta be one or the other. So what do David and Mark uh, respond to the notion that the country has a long-standing history of, pre of preventing concealed carry of firearms? I, I would make uh, just a couple of quick points about that. Number one, that was dicta. Number two, Justice Stevens has bragged that he forced uh, you know, that language in through Kennedy into the opinion. Perhaps more importantly, we talked a lot about text and history today, but we didn't talk about the third part of the Trinity, tradition. And it's an important question. And what Judge Kavanaugh explained in the DC Circuit in the Heller Three case was, Tradition can only confirm when the text and the history point to one result. Tradition is only relevant if it comes in in, in a you know sort of confirming way. So, if, for example, New York had banned the possession of handguns for a hundred years, that would be a tradition. It's a hundred years old, but it wouldn't have any sort of firm. You know, uh, it's not a confirming analytic, and it would therefore be irrelevant. So, and, and really, it was, should be a tradition from the founding era too. I should correct myself, but so, uh, but even a tradition from the founding era cannot trump text and history. I don't know if Mark has more to say. Nothing that Jonathan, would you like to respond to that at all? Well, I mean, I, I think the 
the history and tradition of regulating public carry, including prohibiting most public carrying of guns, uh, is just pretty clear. And that's what uh, you know, Judge Bybee and Judge Ludig both came to that conclusion. Um, the Supreme Court a century ago in Robertson v. Baldwin uh, recognized that longstanding mm -hmm. tradition of, of uh, prohibiting concealed carry. So um, I do think that that's, uh, yeah, again, the, the, the history is clear and it goes well beyond Dodge City. It goes to Texas and, and others. And, and I could just briefly uh, just read an example of a 19th century opinion that upheld one of these. Um, the, uh, and I think it's important, this was the Supreme Court of Texas in a case that, that the Heller majority cited, uh, English v. State. Um, the court said, in the great social compact under and by which states and communities are bound and held together, each individual has compromised the right to avenge his own wrongs and must look to the state for redress. We must not go back to that state of barbarism in which each claims the right to administer the law in his own case. And I think that really gets to it. I mean, we have a social compact where we cede some of our liberties uh, to the state and you know, Mississippi and Alabama can have a different judgment and decide that people should broadly carry, but it's certainly within the history and tradition for states like New York and California and others to uh, take a different approach. I think it's worth just distinguishing those two Texas cases that the anti-gun community likes to bring up all the time uh, as to why they're really irrelevant to the Second Amendment. First of all, both of those uh, Texas decisions involved a Texas constitutional provision that was fuzzier than the Second Amendment, which as of that moment had not been incorporated and applied to the states, number one. Number two is we have to also look at the historical context of Texas when these cases came about, which is the late 19th, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, basically, if you look at the uh, situation in Texas at the time, you had former generals of the Union Army that were sitting on the Texas Supreme Court overseeing gun confiscation and gun disarmament efforts of the former Confederates that lived in Texas. So in many respects, you could distinguish those just by saying these were a form of military occupation orders by Texas Supreme Court restricting the right to carry of former enemy combatants against the unions. Third is, I would say, of course, this is very late in the day. Heller talks about the founding era. You know, what did the founders understand when they wrote the text of the Second Amendment? Uh, anything in the late 19th century after the Civil War, you know, doesn't speak to that. And last but not least, even if you look at Texas law at the time, there's, there was a rule that says you could travel with guns and as to whether or not travel meant traveling across the state or around town, you know, there was a debatable proposition, but there's a lot of unique facets to those Texas decisions when you drill down um, that doesn't really speak to the meaning of the Second Amendment today or at the founding. Terrific. Uh, we have so many people lined up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to questions earlier than I planned uh, under one condition. Ask a question and make it short, sir. Yes, thank you. My name is Howard Klein. Uh, I moved, I'm, I'm from Florida. I moved to, from California because my M1 carbine from World War II was going to be an assault weapon and I would have to get fingerprinted to buy a box of shells at the range. My question has to do with, I want to f focus on something other than the language of the Second Amendment. I would like to ask the view of the panelists of what rights, what the right of self-defense was Pro, that was protected, in my opinion, under the Ninth Amendment that was so fundamental that people who had no other constitutional rights, the right to own property, or they were, they were women, minors, people who had, they couldn't vote, they couldn't own property, they couldn't contract, but they were deemed to have a right of self-defense with arms. So what is the view of the panelists on, let's get away from the Second Amendment, let's go to the fundamental right of self-defense, which predates the Second Amendment, and, could, and the Second Amendment could not be interpreted to constrain that basic right. Thank you. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Ninth Amendment, but I would say that uh, the key insight behind your question is that it's a pre-existing right. Uh, it comes from the English Bill of Rights. It was, and it may predate that as well, but certainly by 1689, this was uh, a right that all Englishmen, and by extension Americans, uh, enjoyed and 
Um, so that's, it's pre-existing, and it's not uh, just the, as though it were created in 1791. I, I think there's four points that go right to your question. The first is if you actually just look at the text of the Second Amendment, it clearly protects a pre-existing right because of the way it's written, right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms, right? It presupposes the existence of something. It's not creating the right. It's recognizing and codifying something that was already always understood to exist, number one. Number two is we know that self-defense, including for women, was protected at the time of our founding by at least two stories, and I'm sure that Stephen Habrick I saw walked in, I'm sure he has like 50 other stories at the founding period that he could tell you. But we know that ben Benjamin Franklin's wife used firearms with friends to protect the ripping down of his home, Ben Franklin's home, because there was concern that Franklin was behind some of the coercive acts like the Stamp Act, etc. And there was a mob that tried to tear down Franklin's home and Benjamin Franklin's wife with guns stopped that from taking place. And we know this because Franklin wrote a letter to his wife saying, thank you for getting the guns to protect our home from being torn down by the mob. Right? So she was allowed to use self-defense. And of course, James Q. Wilson, one of our, well, I'm not, not, not James Q., but James Wilson, one of the first Supreme Court justices, who was a founding father, he used guns with his friends to prevent his house from being torn down by a mob. And um, uh, so, yeah, I think there, and of course, David alluded to the Boston Massacre, where John Adams, one of the founding fathers and one of our first presidents, said at trial in defending the British officers that, yeah, we admit that these Americans, these Bostonians, had a right to bear arms to protect themselves peaceably and defensively in Boston at the time of the founding. So I think those three examples alone uh, demonstrate that the right of self-defense was pre-existing, did exist, and applied not just to um, not just to men, but also to women in the form of Ben Franklin's wife. So uh, just briefly, I, I one, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point, and I do think that the self-defense tradition would have been a firmer basis for the Heller decision than the Second Amendment. Um, you know, I, I think that the Heller decision, and, and it's not just me, I mean, Nelson Lund is, uh, has attacked the analysis in, in, in that, um, you know, it, it basically erased half of the constitutional text. I'm not sure if there's any constitutional text that has been so, you know, dissed as that <laughs> first part. Um, you know, and, and I think maybe the court was conflating these two traditions um, improperly. Um, however, I do think when we're talking about public carry, I don't think the self-defense tradition helps you because you, I, I don't believe, and there was a, a uh, amicus brief by Professor uh, Eric Rubin on the self-defense tradition. Um, I don't think it would entitle you to uh, you know, take out your gun in a public space where someone else has an equal right to be and shoot them. Um, you know, like the, the uh, I mean, Trayvon Martin's death, for example, I and mean, that would be an example, real world example of, of how this self-defense right in public could play out, right? There was a, a man who had a gun for self-defense. He followed uh, this uh, teenager who was unarmed, and then it came to a situation where he thought, after following him, that he needed to pull out his gun for self-defense, that's what he said, and he pulled him out and killed this teenager, unarmed teenager. Um, that's a real-world example. Um, the, the petitioners in Bruin would claim that he had not just a legal right, but a constitutional right to do exactly what he did. Um, I don't think the common law self-defense tradition supports that. And that's why you had the NRA push for stand your ground laws, um, which would, you know, which went beyond the common law tradition. The reason you needed that legislation is because the common law didn't support shooting other people in places where that other person has a right to be. Gentleman at the back microphone. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Marissa Cohen, a uh, woman, but it's oh, okay. I'm, I'm that means sorry. I look good I'm in a suit. Um, so, uh, self-proclaimed Yankee. Uh, so in the oral argument, we could say that I think Sonia Sotomayor actually argued for New York better than New York argued for itself. But <laughs> it, the argument was telling of a bit of a mess of the justices in general because if these are going to be the people who are going to decide gun rights going forward, how far do we want them to go? Because John Roberts said, okay, I understand that New Yorkers don't want people to have it in Giant Stadium. Well, Giant Stadium is in New Jersey. So, I mean, if this... <laughs> 
we, they don't really know where their grounded is. So, and uh, Mr. Smith, when you were speaking, you said that there, there are these objective qualifications that come into play. Well, if there is a, a qualification and objective standards, then that means that there isn't this all go free, have a gun sort of system. There has to be some sort of foundation and there has to be some sort of line that's drawn. Where is the line that you guys want to see drawn compared to the line that New York actually has in place? Thank you. Where to draw the line? Well, I think it's a relatively easy way to draw a line, right? I think the first answer is I think everyone over the age of 18, because at the time of our founding, 18-year-olds were not only allowed to have guns, they were in many instances required to have guns in terms of local and state militia and other obligations. So 18-year-olds, and I think David's actually got a case on that, so I would say anyone over 18 that's a law-abiding citizen in terms of not a convicted felon, basically under 18 U.S.C. 922 of the federal code, it sets forth a series of disqualifying people, meaning uh, you've been adjudicated mentally incompetent because if you can't take care of yourself, well, you can't have a gun or probably do other things, right? Uh, if you're a convicted felon, I know there's a debate about nonviolent versus violent felons, which may come up down the road, uh, but if you're a convicted felon, you can't have a gun. But if you're basically a law-abiding American, right, over the age of 18, you are entitled to that constitutional right to keep and bear arms no different than if you're entitled to the constitutional rights under the criminal procedure rules. You're entitled to, engage, to get married, to enter into contracts, to, uh, to enter into a gay marriage according to the Supreme Court, right? Uh, or to do any of these other things. You're an American adult. And remember, in America, we presume individual liberty first. Mother may I, right? We're Americans, right? We don't go mother may I to the government and say, please, Mr. Government, can I get this? No, it works in reverse. When in doubt, you have the freedom to do it. Only when you demonstrate you're incapable of making responsible decisions as an adult do we take that right away from you. But until then, you should have the right to exercise all your rights, including but not limited to your Second Amendment rights. Mr. Smith, let me just ask for a, a point of clarification. You say 18. Yes. But um, my recollection, um, it's been some years since I, I had to adjudicate a case in this area, but my recollection is that some of the states uh, required militia service as early as 14 or 16, and if that's so, why would you draw the line at 18 instead of an age that's consistent with the age of militia service? Because I think the best way to draw the line for the Second Amendment is by looking at the federal militia acts, not one. There's actually two militia acts of uh, 1792. And in both of the federal militia acts, I believe the age set by the first Congress, which, by the way, was the first Congress that adopted the Second Amendment, uh, that same group of people said that 18 was the proper age for militia service. And therefore, I think since they wrote the Second Amendment and the militia acts of 1792 and set the age at 18, I think that's why it should be 18. And even though you are correct, historically, there are instances of younger folks in some of the state rules, but I think the right answer, because you do have to draw lines at some point, is probably the first Congress's line drawing at 18. Okay, super. Any, well, uh, John? So, I think, first of all, I, I think that the first freedom is the right to live, and that that's infringed by uh, these permissive carry laws. I mean, of course, the, the right to carry guns that's being sought is not a right to carry guns as fashion accessories. It's a right to carry guns in order to use them in self-defense, which means, like from George Zimmerman's perspective, to take the gun out and shoot and potentially kill another person when that individual deems it necessary. And even if that's a crime, of course, it turns out that it's a crime, it's of course too late for the victim. So, so I, I do think that that's where we should start any analysis. But I think it's, it's worth looking at the sensitive places discussion. I thought it was a great question because it exposes all sorts of fallacies in, in this uh, argument. Uh, I mean, for one, you know, if, you're, um, if you think you should keep guns out of Giant Stadium, um, assuming that they have jurisdiction in New Jersey, um, you know, that um, because it's crowded, well then why don't you keep guns out of, you know, other places where it's crowded? The New York City subways are very crowded, of course. Then there was, Justice Alito said, well, if you 
Oh, I think uh, Mr. Clement said if you restrict access to a place, then it can be sensitive. Well, does that mean if you have a free concert at Giant Stadium that allows in anyone, then guns are permitted? I don't think so. Um, then there was the argument, and I think this was uh, Justice Alito, that places where there is security can be sensitive places because you don't need your gun because it's being, security is being provided for you. And my thought was, really? Does that mean that the Supreme Court or any court, if the metal detector is not working and the guards are on strike, that judges would feel comfortable having you know, families of the defendant and everyone else uh, packing heat, loaded guns? Um, again, I don't think so. So I don't think that there was a logical line that was drawn. And of course, it exposed the ultimate fallacy, which is if guns are the recipe for safety, why are you restricting them? I mean, isn't the, wouldn't the safest Yankee Stadium be one in which everyone has loaded guns? Um, and the courtroom, um, you, know, uh, you know, your honor, when you're hearing a, a, a case with a criminal defendant, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a mob boss <laughs> and their entourage is all, all has loaded guns. Is that, you know, apparently the logic is that's the safest scenario. Again, I don't think so. Maybe there's some who feel that. Thank uh, Monsieur Briard. Thank you, Judge. Uh, my name is uh, Briard. I'm a, I'm a French citizen, and uh, I would like to make a short remark and, and, and one question. Uh, the, sh the short remark is that I often hear here in this country uh, the U.S. should do like uh, Europeans, and especially like the French, and uh, it would be much safer, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, I, I, I'd like to remind you that for the French, for the French, during our revolution, we regarded the right to bear arms as a part of our freedom. And the prohibition of bearing arms is very recent, is 1939, okay? And the, the right to bear arms is still today uh, an issue in our country. I have a question for Mr. Lowy. I heard that you made a connection between uh, the, 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 the prohibition or the restrictions to bear arms and, and uh, uh, safety and, and death by violence. My question is, who are you talking about? Are you talking about uh, bad or honest people? I mean, when you say many people die from arms, uh, I'd like to know whether if if in states uh, which uh, 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 prohibit uh, uh, the, or restrict the, the bearing of arms, are there more uh, honest people who die from violence? This is my question. Well, I mean, the studies show that states with restrictive gun laws have the lowest gun death rates, with permissive law, the states with permissive laws have the highest gun death rates. And as I say, you know, same thing with, with carry laws, that you know, w when states have allowed permissive carry, there is a higher, um, higher gun death rate. Now, when you say whether are these honest people or not honest people, um, I mean, uh, Trayvon Martin, is, we, let's, we have concrete examples here. I mean, he was, by all accounts, an, an honest person. He was a teenager walking to his father's, um, you know, carrying <laughs> Skittles and a, and a soft drink, and, and he, was, he was killed, um, you know, by a, what I think people would call an honest person who thought he was exercising his Second Amendment rights. I mean, um, so, you know, even, I think it's also sort of a fallacy to talk about honest or not honest because, you know, even if there's justification um, you know, we don't have the death penalty for those offenses. I mean, Ahmad Arbery's, you know, killers are on trial right now, right? This, you know, two men who followed him, thought he looked like someone who, or heard of someone who had broken into, you know, committed some robberies or thefts or something, and they killed him. Um, now, I don't know whether Ahmad Arbery was guilty or not. 
Um, I, I don't think there was any basis for this. Um, but of course, even if he was guilty, we don't have capital punishment for that crime. And we certainly don't have civilians making on the spot judgments that they're going to inflict capital punishment. And that's what happened. And that's what does happen. And those are examples of quote unquote good guys. Let me just um, say, well, if, if I may, um, uh, you know, I think when we talk about the gun death rate, we're asking the wrong question. In ancient Rome, the gun death rate was zero. The question is, uh, and if you had a society with no guns, you'd have a zero gun death rate. The question is, uh, to the extent any of this matters under tiers of scrutiny, what's the death rate? And if you, because you have a powerful substitution effect where people will use other means of killing each other. Um, and when we look at the so social sciences, you know, can, can we really tell what these numbers mean? The National Academy of Sciences did a meta study uh, and they said, you just can't tell. It's just not a significant causal factor in crime whether you have these laws or not. Now, John Donahue of Stanford Law School says that he can tell. He has created, he doesn't compare actual states, he compares synthetic states. He takes part of California and combines it with part of Mississippi and says if you take this hypothetical state and compare it with this other one and you treat these laws like a light switch, whether they're either in this camp or not, then there's a problem. And Bill English uh, has come forward and just blown that apart by showing, number one, you know, the synthetic analysis doesn't work in this context, number one. But number two, it's not a light switch because the moment that you have one of these laws passed and people can start carrying, it takes time. In Florida, it took a couple of decades for there to be millions of people with carriage licenses. And if you look at that as a time sequence, you see all of the allegedly bad effects go to zero and flip positive and that these laws actually have a positive effect. That went into the Supreme Court. New York and its allies had no answer to Bill English. It was conceded the validity of his study. There is no answer to it. And so the social science is clear. These laws are beneficial. It doesn't matter because the founders took this policy off the table um, and we look at text and history and I trust the founders rather than the New York State Legislature in 1911. But you know, the reality is if we were going to decide our laws this way, the social science would favor those who favor carriage. Yeah, and I want to add a few things because Trayvon Martin keeps coming up. I think there's a few points that need to be understood about this situation. The first is, in America, we're citizens and not subjects, again. So the, the, being a right of citizen means you have a right to bear arms. The second of all is, I think that you raise an excellent point and you can break down the statistics. If you actually look at the data of gun deaths, which is, of course, gun deaths. Guns don't kill anyone. Criminals kill people, but it's right. Let's talk about criminals using gun deaths. First of all, uh, you have to take the gun violence statistics and cut it by 66% because when they talk about gun violence, two thirds of that is suicides. So now you're looking at a subsegment of just homicides by guns. Then what you do, and you can do this, uh, you take a look at the number of deaths where the perpetrator had a felony record and then you look at the number of instances where the victim also had a felony record. And what you find is most of these crimes involving guns are gang related, criminal on criminal, killing each other in gang battles in places like Chicago. And the way to do that is you look at the perp and the victim, and when they're both felonies and they're both felons with convicted records, ding, 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 neither is allowed to own a gun under federal law. So any more gun control law won't work because they're not allowed to have a gun. And by the way, on the Trayvon Martin thing, here is the lesson of Trayvon Martin. The lesson of Trayvon Martin, Martin is this, that defensive gun uses of the type that Bill English talked about, where you have 1.67 million of them a year or over 4,000 a day, Defensive gun uses are reported in the media at best locally, if at all. The misuse of guns is reported by the Washington Post and the New York Times and the national legacy mainstream media all the time. So they talk all about the guns are bad side of the equation and they conveniently ignore the defensive gun use side of the equation, except when they talk about something like Trayvon Martin. But let's talk about Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman real quick. George Zimmerman's head was beat on the ground with concrete so badly that the photographs at the time that the police investigated this, they said, there's no crime here. This is clearly an act of self-defense. 
only several months after the decision not to charge George Zimmerman with the death of Trayvon Martin, only after a PR campaign that really drove the district attorney to charge George Zimmerman, did they charge George Zimmerman, who then tried the case and was then exonerated by self-defense. So this notion that Trayvon Martin is an example of an innocent person getting shot or something by a criminal or a law-abiding citizen with a gun was simply not true because, again, Zimmerman's shot was deemed self-defense. It, it was actually not even charged, and then it was charged, and then it was tried, and then it was self-defense. And I think we may see something similar in Wisconsin this week. Only time will tell. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say that we're, we're too short on time to take your questions, uh, but you're certainly welcome to, uh, to chat after. Um, thank you all for coming. The luncheon is across the hall, the Rosencrantz debate. Please thank our panelists. <laughs>